now we come down to some of the detail and cross-examination, and that will happen before and after lunch. Uh, before lunch, uh, there will be a representative of an Isle of Grain option, and of course there isn't a single owner to that option, followed by the three shortlisted scheme promoters in the afternoon who will present their cases for their relative concepts together with a brief technical overview. They will then be cross-examined by an expert panel against the eight SIF uh, criteria used by the Commission. Just a reminder, I'm sure you know it, but just like you know New Testament, Old Testament, etc. They are strategic fit, economy, surface access, environment, people, cost, operational viability and delivery. And of course, as of today um, from Sir Howard, we know what we're going to be looking for going forward. So what will happen now is we will talk about the Isle of Grain proposal, then I'll invite our expert panel to the stage to cross-examine them before lunch. Now, representing our first scheme is a presentation by Hugh Thomas, a partner of Foster and Partners. Hugh joined Foster's in 1987, working from the outset on the redevelopment of the King's Cross area, including the station, and what a massive success that has been. He's continued to work on major infrastructure projects, stadia and master plans, with recent projects including Wembley Stadium, St Pancras International Rail Terminal, Queen Alia International Airport in Jordan, and the Haramein High Speed Railway stations in Saudi Arabia. He's also Foster's lead on the Thames Hub proposal. He's going to be examining the estuary proposition. Specifically, he's going to make the case for the inner estuary airport on the Isle of Grain and try to convince us it should be on the Commission's shortlist. Hugh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. That was a, a good start. Uh, not as loud as um, an A380, maybe, but... Uh, Am I coming across? Excellent. Uh, we've heard a lot today so far about the reasons why we need aviation capacity. We've also heard an awful lot about the problems that that will bring. The problems of trying to fit aviation into a crowded economy, a crowded urban context, a crowded society. And the issues that society faces in terms of developing our economy and living peaceful, enjoyable lives. Why do we keep trying to squeeze a quart into a pint pot? What we should be looking to do is move the aviation capacity we desperately require to a location where it doesn't impact on people. And putting aviation in the context of the rest of the world, the way we've heard about our economic growth, the challenges we face, the way that cities are growing around the world, and the markets that we will have to access, the competition we will face from other economies in developing our own potential. If you map that out around the world, you see that 90% of the world's GDP is in the Northern Hemisphere, almost 90% of the world's population. We're in an extraordinarily privileged location. And unfortunately, the slides seem to be squashed. Um, the placement of London in the Northern Hemisphere and the access we have through short haul and long haul to global markets is quite extraordinary. If you begin to place that in terms of our access to those markets and where people will be coming to and from, you see the extraordinary opportunity that Northwest Europe actually has. It's not about build it and they will come. It's recognizing the fact that they're going past us anyway. What should we actually be providing for our economy for future generations so that we can access at global activity. And that's where we come from as a company that works 90% of our businesses overseas. It's outside the UK. We see exactly the conversations that people are having, the questions they're asking, and the solutions that they're finding. That's why we think that the estuary is the, the best location, because if you put it in the context of the growth that we're seeing in our economy, the population growth that we're seeing, it's the area where we will be investing. London shrank after the war. People exited London to the new towns. Massive government policy for redistribution of population. Changes in the way we worked and where we worked. The new towns filled up. And slowly, in the 80s, we began to repopulate London. We didn't notice. London had emptied. There was space. 
we began to fill London up. And it's only now that we've filled it up that we actually recognize the challenges that we face. The areas in blue that just came up are areas to the east of London where you'll see population growth of 22 to 30 percent on government and local statistics over the next 20 years. That's where London's going to grow. That's where our economy is going to grow. That's where we need to provide jobs. That's population growth. We're living longer lives. Our demographics are changing. Population growth doesn't mean an incremental increase in numbers of homes. It means we need more homes. We're seeing a demand for 30% more homes nationally over the next 20 to 25 years. How are we going to provide those? How are we going to provide the infrastructure that they will require? And how can that actually fit into national policy? There been recent reports about government considering new towns. How do we put all of that into context? And how do we link it to infrastructure decisions? And why is the debate so critical now? Is it a bit like us seeing the growth of London, seeing London fill up? Are we actually missing the fact that London is filling up? If you compare where London is now to our, our European, our near neighbour competitors, what you see is that um, Paris and Frankfurt are handling more air traffic movements than Heathrow. And we see that they've got capacity to grow, and we don't. And we focus on their capacity. But we don't recognise that, like London, they're filling up. They will be full. They'll hit their Heathrow moment. They'll hit the Heathrow moment, potentially at the moment, according to Eurocontrol, that we will manage to deliver an extra runway in the southeast. What do we really want? What does Northwest Europe really want? Does it want a third runway at Heathrow and a fourth runway at Heathrow for a hub, for uh, a hub to service those economies? Or really, does Northwest Europe, does our economy, the whole of our nation, actually need a globally significant hub that will fit in with global activity, global GDP growth. That's why we believe an inner estuary option is the right option, because it delivers the things that we can't deliver anywhere else. Working in a global context, it gives you 24-hour access because of the noise reductions that it offers. It allows you to start of 110 million passengers per annum within a growth that you can forecast, but it gives you the capacity to add additional passenger facilities, simple tin boxes. You've got the runways, you've got the taxiways in place. You add the tin boxes to grow the capacity as you require it, whether that's limited by our carbon commitments or whether it's um, limited by other activity. You've actually got the choice. Four runways. Four runways because they will give you the resilience that you need whether it's weather events, whether it's external events. It allows you to deal with the wave factors that are essential for hub operation. It's immediately adjacent to high speed one, something that gives us access to continental Europe, yes, but with the growth of high speed two, the implementation of high speed two, to the rest of the country. So it gives us the access that we require to the whole of the country, whole of Europe and locally. And <coughs> critically, it's deliverable by the private sector. The whole question that's been touched on about environmental impact of aviation. It doesn't matter where you put the runway capacity, the planes flying will emit the same amount of carbon when they're in the air. It's when they come to approach the airport, they're held in a stack, or they move on the ground, or they wait to take off. That's where you can have a massive impact. You can design an airport from scratch so it's the most efficient airport in the world. It minimizes the emissions of the area that you can control them. Reduces uh, emissions also by providing an efficiency of access. By basing access on public transport on rail, it gives us the opportunity to actually get people in the most low carbon form to the airport. Surface access then, to our minds, is absolutely essential. To look at the big picture, not to try and squeeze a quart into a pint pot, not try and get the most out of it, oversaturated network, a network that we know we're going to be adding more and more pressure to, actually looks somewhere where we've got capacity. We proved it during the Olympics. The Olympics was incredibly successful in terms of the way it used High Speed One to get people to Stratford. There is an extraordinary opportunity for us to use regional services to get to an airport, also to use those services to get to the rest of the UK through High Speed Two and to get into Northwest Europe. Crossrail already has protected powers to Gravesend. 
the ability to extend Crossrail offers an extraordinary opportunity to connect right back into the heart of London. And then there are the underutilized rail assets on the classic network. Why do we not recognize, why do most of us in this room not recognize those assets exist? It's because nobody uses them. That's why they're underutilized. There's an extraordinary opportunity. Such a degree of opportunity to give really robust, high capacity access on day one to service 110 million passengers using high speed one, using connections to the West Coast Main Line, using Great Western connections on the North London Line, using Crossrail and Classic Network. 20 trains an hour in each direction, possible into the, uh, to the airport. Possible by creating a link back to that existing network provided by the private sector, but also recognizing that as London grows, there will be demand on that network and we'll have to provide additional facilities. We've made the decision as to where we're gonna put that new hub. We can factor that into the decision making around where does the transport go that will service that increased population, that increased economic growth. We also look at how do you provide park and ride. The last thing we want to be doing is encouraging people to drive to an airport. If people have to drive, or they have to use road-based public transport from where they live to get to the airport, let's take them to a park and ride station. Let's use that network we're creating to allow people to access the airport from further away. So strategically located park and ride stations that give us that direct access. People worry about, is this all doable? Now, are we capable of doing this as a nation? We've got bigger tasks to face in terms of accommodating 20% increase in population, honestly, even an airport. We need to look strategically at everything we're doing and see how that we get the best out of the investments we'll inevitably have to make. Other economies have done it. We did it, Britain. We took the decision, pre-handover, in Hong Kong, that we should move the airport. That decision was made in London. We should move Ch um, Kai Tak to Chetlak Kok. As a company, we spent just over six years seeing the demolition of the island, the Chaplak Cock, and the creation of the airport there. Consistently voted one of the most uh, favored airports by passengers, the busiest freight airport in the world. We took that decision because it was vital for us to trade into China post handover. It's been extraordinarily successful for us as an economy, but it's not the future. The future is access through multiple routes to lots of destinations to those emerging cities that will be our vital trading partners. Trade not just passengers. Trade with vital, as we heard from Jaguar Land Rover, goods. Access, if we want to be a high value manufacturing economy, if we want to trade our services into a global marketplace, we've got to get those goods into those markets. We've got to connect to those cities. We've got to build those routes. We've got to get that capacity. And belly freight, the area underneath the seats that we sit on, is where we will get that. Something like 90% of goods um, shipped out of this country by air actually go through Heathrow by value. It's extraordinary the value of belly freight to us. A location in the estuary begins to give you all of those potentials and advantages. It allows you to plan air routes that don't fly over major centers of population, that approach predominantly over the sea, take off through routes that don't fly over towns and cities. Because noise is really what we hear about all the time. We hear the statistics, but honestly, our ears don't read those numbers. Our ears hear the noise, and I completely agree that we become less tolerant as a society. As we pack more and more people into London, Honestly, we're becoming less tolerant. Noise is increasingly becoming an issue for everyone. It's not just aviation noise, I accept. There are a whole series of noises, isn't it? road traffic noise. Aviation is a defining factor. It is a problem that we have to address seriously. Move the airport, move the source of the noise away from the people. It doesn't matter what you tell people about how planes are getting quieter, they don't hear it. Their ears don't hear the statistics. In terms of airspace, Europe has a fundamental problem. It's not just us. Europe has a problem full stop. Eurocontrol recognized that airports are filling up and our airspace is filling up. 
we have to solve European airspace in any case. Safety, another critical issue. Those planes flying up with the only city, major city in the world, that allows aircraft to approach over the centre. Bird strikes, critical if you consider an estuary location, impact of bird strikes. But by planning an airport, you're able to actually mitigate against where birds will be and their flight paths. It's no coincidence that out of um, the 30 top airports in the world, 11 are on coastal sites and 14 are within five kilometers of the coast. People put airports where there aren't people, where they can approach over the sea. In terms of wider environmental risk, we've come at this from the, the, um, the point of view of what is happening to our environment? What do we have to deal with as a society in terms of uh, environmental loss, regardless of an airport? The recent storm surge last year, bigger than the storm surge in 53, the storms that have battered our coasts, they seem to be increasing in severity and increasing in occurrence. We're losing that habitat. That's recognized by the Environment Agency. In the Thames Estuary 2100 report, they look at habitat loss and habitat replacement. They set, in a way, the template for how we can create new habitat. In fact, they designate sites on the Isle of Grain uh, where we propose uh, an airport for habitat replacement. We can work with that same methodology but put the habitat in another location, whether it's buying farmland or indeed whether it's creating new land. The knowledge is there, but there's the imperative to do it in any case. In terms of human impact, compared to any of the other options, the density of occupation around the airport site is the lowest. The number of people who would be impacted who live there actually to build the airport is the lowest. But it's in an area of deprivation. Some of the wards in Medway towns are in the most 10% 10, 10 most deprived. Just look at the distances. Proximity to population. Cost, 20 billion to build a new four runway airport compared to 18 billion to build another runway at Heathrow. Why? Because the second worst place to build anything after a war zone is an airport. Who pays? The passenger pays. Whatever the solution, the passenger will pay. What should the passenger get from the money they pay? They should get the most efficient airport possible. They should seek out an airport that reduces ongoing costs. What happens to Heathrow? The redevelopment of Heathrow the opportunities that we've heard of to create a new city. Something we have to face. How do we create a new Milton Keynes Development Corporation, whether it's Heathrow or somewhere else, to accommodate our population growth? It's an issue we have to face. Timeline is exactly the same, whatever your decision. To get to the point where you're able to start construction, the timeline, the legal process is the same. Seven years to build an estuary airport. Lord Foster was so passionate um, about this topic, but unable to join us today. He wanted me to play. I spend my life traveling around the world, and I'm acutely aware of the importance of connectivity. The present and the future, more than ever, is about connecting cities, economies, emerging economies. If we're talking about airport strategy, our contribution in terms of the idea of an estuary airport is based on the fact that over the last 30 years, we designed a succession of airports. They include the biggest in the world, Beijing. Beijing is half the size again in terms of its area as Heathrow. The longest of those projects, six years, Hong Kong, we had to move a mountain and create land. So we've achieved these airports on cost on time, in record time, and they've been voted by the traveling public as the best airport experiences in the world. So it's against that background of knowledge that we question the logic of Heathrow. Even if you've done it now, in 10 years' time, you still have to confront the real issue of creating a proper hub where the approach is not over a city. We're standing here outside our studio in Battersea, next to this residential block. And we have wave after wave of these aircraft coming in. It's not just the noise. It's not just the pollution. Think of the risk. CAA statistics out recently indicate that every three months, 
an aircraft overflies London either low on fuel or with an engine failure. That over the next 20 years, there'll be a 20% increase in population for an eastward expansion of London. We're talking about the region of the Medway towns, which statistically are deprived relative to the rest of the nation. So there is an opportunity here to use the airport development to regenerate those towns, to improve their prosperity, their connectivity. The potential for it to bring prosperity, not just in terms of the Southeast, but the United Kingdom as a whole. Cost of doing business as usual is unaffordable and is certainly greater than this initiative. Does it need more courage to go this way? Of course it does. We have a responsibility to plan for future generations. But there is no reason why this cannot be done now and present generations can have the benefit of it. But it is a true investment for the future. Welcome uh, to, uh, there will be time for questions, but our expert panel have got to get in first. Uh, there's time for our, yeah, and, and to you too. Here we go. We're going to have our expert panel first. They will be questioning for 15 minutes and then five minutes from the floor. Vicky Price, who's an economist and business consultant, please come to the stage. Her past roles have included Director General for Economics at the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills and Joint Head of the UK Government's Econ uh, Economic Service. She's previously been a partner and chief economist at KPMG. Hugh Sumner, the former Director of Transport for the Olympic Delivery Authority. Hugh's recently established his own transport consultancy, but for the last decade has been inextricably linked to transport aspects of the London 2012 Games, where his teams and partners put in 6.5 billion pounds of games-related transport infrastructure. He was previously managing director from a major infrastructure company before that led the team that operated and maintained London Underground. Professor Paul Hooper, Head of Enterprise Development at Manchester Metropolitan University. His work contributes to the Centre for Air Transport and the Environment. Over the last two decades, he's developed and extended his teaching and research interests to cover environmental management, corporate environmental and social responsibility, clean technology and sustainable development policy and practice. Last but not least, Simon Calder, journalist, broadcaster and travel commentator. Simon is British leading travel commentator. He's senior travel editor of The Independent, and writes under the strap line, the man who pays his way. He doesn't accept any free transport or accommodation for the travel guide. One of his first jobs was cleaning planes for Sir Freddie Laker at Gatwick. And he's phoned in this morning direct from Argentina. Any delay? Uh, I was um, nine minutes late, but um, I did fly over the Isle of Grain on the way. Just, and, uh, just you got him to do a quick detour exactly, just so you could yes. check it out. Thank you. Uh, right. Mud and sheep. So where we have, we're now at 11.30 and we're going to 11.45 with questions. The idea is that we'll hopefully get around the panel twice uh, to uh, talk to you, beginning with Vicky, please. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, there are two questions that I do have, but hopefully the second one will be um, afterwards. In terms of the SIF criteria, we've split it between us so that the audience understands. And I'm doing cost and strategic fit and the economic impact. So in terms of the strategic fit first, um, it looks great because, of course, we'll have uh, four runways, possibly extend them to six, uh, that allows the flexibility and everything else that we want to have. Uh, but of course, what the Commission has come up with is um, a concern that, in fact, at the end of the day, we're only really adding very little capacity, maybe only equivalent to one extra runway at Heathrow because you would have to close a number of the other airports around, possibly Stansted, certainly City, um, and uh, uh, of course we'll close Heathrow. Uh, so how do you um, answer this, that in fact for an awful lot more cost, and we'll get the cost in a minute, um, you end up with nothing very much more than what you'd have, forgetting the, the, the noise for a moment, forgetting the, the air pollution. Uh, just in terms of the strategic fit, in terms of meeting the capacity needs of the country? I, I, I think it's questionable, certainly, whether Stansted would have to close. Heathrow, absolutely. Um, city, again, is questionable, and Southend, we think, is questionable. 
So does that actually mean you really lose capacity? We don't think so. Four runways gives you not only capacity, but critical resilience. Um, Heathrow has no resilience. So if there was any kind of perturbation in the system, that leads to delay. It immediately leads to a cancellation of flights. And what is the most annoying thing you can do? Let a passenger get to an airport and then tell them their flight's cancelled. You have no capacity to deal with delays. Uh, four runways gives you that, so you get a massive advantage there. Certainly, we've designed, uh, our starting point was to say that 110 million passengers is forecastable, is knowable, and we should be able to finance on the basis of 110, build the passenger facilities for 110, have the transport networks for 110, and if you know you're going to get bigger than that, you've already got the runway and the taxiways in place. We are using them at international, better than international standards in terms of uh, utilization. So you've got that opportunity um, to improve your system. Okay, just, just quickly come in on uh, uh, Joanna Averly. I just see a quick tweet coming in. Like for like comparison, Heathrow New Runway 18 billion, Isle of Green 20 billion, remove the mountain Hong Kong from the airport. 18 billion is Heathrow's figures. Um, honestly, we work on airports around the world. The most expensive place you can do anything is next to an operational airport. There's security constraints, your hours of operation, limitations on craneage, the size of the leverage you can get. Here we are, surrounded by water. We've got access on three sides of water. We can create construction sites around the UK, build <coughs> massive components, and ship them in. We can mobilize the trip. We've spoken to the world's largest dredge fleets. We would have to do two and a half to three times the dredge that London Gateway has done. So it's an order of magnitude larger than London Gateway, but it, it's not um, something which is undoable. Those are simple things to do. Thank you. Probably there, I'm tasked to take up uh, surface access and deliverability. Firstly, in terms of surface access, the Danish interim report talks around 28 billion pounds worth of transport upgrades required to support your proper proposal. Firstly, who do you envisage will pay for that? And secondly, how are you going to achieve something like 60 or 70 percent mode share by rail when in comparison to a lot of other places we are wedded to use of the car or the taxi to get to the airport? Yeah. We don't believe that is uh, the right figure for 110 million passenger airport. We believe there's capacity in the network and that is our starting point. There is phenomenal capacity and accessibility to the use uh, to 110 million. Yes, to go above 110 million, you would have to provide extra uh, capacity. What the Mayor of London and TfL have proposed is the new line from Waterloo through Canary Wharf to Barking Riverside. That's predicated more on the growth of London <coughs> than is access to the airport. So we're going to have to provide that infrastructure anyway. If we take a decision to do an estuary airport now, that will factor in to our calculations, our proposals for infrastructure we're going to have to build. In terms of how do you um, persuade people not to use their car, give them an opportunity to get there um, quicker and easier. Give them park and ride. Give them stations where they can drop their bags off before they get on the train. Their bag goes with the train and goes straight into the baggage handling system of the airport. They know that their bag has left them. They're in the system. That sense of relief is enormous. Tom. Uh, it's early on covering environment uh, and uh, must acknowledge the huge benefits in terms of noise, clearly, given the remoteness of this location. Um, but given that I'm here to ask critical questions, uh, the key one has to be around land take and, uh, and, the, and the quality of that land. We've got special protection areas here. Um, and there are two elements to that. One, the requirement to provide replacement habitat. I think we've covered that slightly, but I'd be interested in a bit more detail on that. And then secondly, as I understand it, there's a requirement to demonstrate no feasible alternatives, which you've got a slight problem with, given that you've got a commission looking at feasible alternatives, if you follow me. So um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, clearly there has to be an element of your, of your, of your argument that, that, in effect, blows the others out of the water in order to allow you to overcome the regulatory uh, restrictions on the site? I, I think it's an advantage that the Commission is looking um, at what the proposal should be because the decision clearly is, whatever the decision, the view is there is no other option. That, that's what the process is about. We, we came to this from um, our experience 
in a number of locations where we were seeing environmental change and environmental impact. And we began to recognize that the estorial locations, the um, intertidal habitats, are under threat. Before we mentioned an airport on the Isle of Grain, you Google what was talked about, it was habitat loss. It was still habitat loss. It wasn't because of an airport, it was because of thermal expansion of the oceans, increased severity of uh, storms, tidal surge. So we, we recognized that that habitat had been lost. The Environment Agency recognizes that habitats have been lost. We have to do something about it full stop. We've got to tackle it. What we could do is we could bring a focus, and we are bringing a focus, hopefully, on that habitat loss, and we could bring a pot of money that the only other alternative is that taxpayer finds that money. Well, in mitigating the impact that the uh, airport has, we could bring something uh, to tackle it. We bring a focus, we can bring new thinking, we can bring a scale that could put us at the forefront of addressing habitat loss. Simon. Uh, yes, I, I've just thought of something um, even more annoying than turning up at an airport and finding your flights being cancelled, and that's being forced to move from your established airports to somewhere which is 33 miles east of London, um, at the moment quite inaccessible, and crucially, if you believe the interim report, extraordinarily expensive. The figure quoted by Sir Howard <coughs> is that it would need to be about three times the current settlement for Heathrow for the passenger service charge, and just to remind people that's somewhere between 30 and 40 pounds per departing passenger. So there I am. I'm uh, being forced to catch a park and ride service um, to the airport, uh, even though all the evidence, at, uh, at least from Heathrow and Gatwick, is that people don't really use in-town um, baggage drop. Uh, and on top of that, I'm having to pay, instead of 30 or 40 pounds, somewhere between 90 and 120 pounds, simply to step aboard a, park, uh, a plane at your lovely new airport. Downtown baggage doesn't work because of the um, incremental growth of our existing airports, uh, because you've got to connect. There isn't a single baggage system at uh, Heathrow or Gatwick, so you can't pick up a bag and have it go to, uh, to any gate. Can I just it. check all the other airports you've done? Does it work in any other airports? Yeah, Hong Kong is a prime example of where you have downtown check-in, and you can go straight, uh, you know, your bag travels on the train. So th that's what passengers would like to happen. Um, in, in terms of cost, if you add, if you take a number, inflate it, add 40% and then decide you'd like to add, that, add another 50% on top, it doesn't take long to get to a very big number. You've started off with a big number, you add those factors and you've got an even bigger number. Yeah. But a lot of people leaving from Hong Kong live in Hong Kong, yeah? So their, their bags are local anyway, but a lot of people leaving from London don't live in London. Well, they, they could be travelling from um, further afield um, by train from the, the regions. So their bag in those situations would travel with them on the train. But compare the hassle of having to, uh, to transfer somewhere, going to Dubai. Now, if you transferred in Dubai, the nightmare of, uh, of trying to get your bag if you're going somewhere and it's not through ticketed, um, of going through those airports and the time you spend of flying we live on a globe, we're not um, flat world revisionists. We live on a globe, it's round. The further you get to the equator, the further you have to travel. We're up here. It's a lot, the great circle route, it's a lot easier to go this way than be forced to go down there to go back up again. Uh, do you want to come back in on that point? I've not answered your question, sir. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I simply want to know whether the passenger will be paying more than they are at Heathrow, oh. which is already, although it's um, not what the market would... Uh, would, would uh, result in because the CAA caps the fees, they are still very high. Davis says they will treble with your scenario. Um, how on earth are you going to persuade anybody to go to Heathrow if uh, their fare is suddenly increasing uh, by, by tens of pounds? The business model we've developed, which has been shared with the Commission, uh, takes the starting point that you leave passenger charges as they are today, plus inflation. Okay, back to Vicky. We've well, got four minutes with you guys, then out for five minutes to the audience. So Simon has uh, uh, not followed the rules and talked about costs, of course, but never mind. Uh, he, he was going up some mountain at the time we were discussing this, so it was an excuse. Um, but it is a big issue. Um, if you're not going to treble the charges, as Simon was saying, then there is a huge public subsidy that's, that's required there. It's true that the figures have been doubled by the Commission, the ones we've put, but they've done exactly the same in terms of adding a risk factor and an optimism bias factor. 
in all the calculations. So all the bids that came in have had the same treatment. Admittedly, we started from perhaps a higher figure, and therefore the impact is greater. But we end up with something like between 80 and 100 billion, or more than 100 billion, what the cost would be. And if you're not to turbo the charges, then we're talking about a public subsidy of possible 65 billion coming in, which has to be raised, of course, by the taxpayer or some guarantees or whatever. And of course, at the end, it's an extra cost to, to everyone. The only way I can think that you can square the circle is A, through whatever redevelopment cost of PISO there might be, but they take a lot of time, and B, through whatever generation positive impact you think there may be in th that area of London, which then adds to the benefits. Now, that, of course, needs to be calculated properly and hasn't quite been done yet. We heard quite a lot about this earlier, of course. Uh, can, you, can you comment on that? Because immediately, of course, it makes, and that is why it wasn't in the shortlisted options, it, for the moment, it makes it a very, very expensive and very public subsidy dependent option. But once we put ourselves in the role of uh, our client, um, how would we develop an airport? What should we be paying for? What is the, the deliverable financial model? We looked at an airport that at 110 million could be constructed for 20 billion, including the um, remediation costs, including uh, an assessment of, um, of risk, including movement from Heathrow, including land purchase, etc. All, all of that is in our report. So 20 billion, we believe, is a private sector deliverable cost for an airport. And you can find that figure, measure it around the world. That's the cost of an airport. The links we think are appropriate are to High Speed One and to an extended crossrail. That's four billion. So 24 billion for a new airport and the links that give you a capacity of 110. So, so the Commission's wrong in saying 110. How far out do you want to go? <laughs> uh, I mean, what do you want to throw in? Yeah. Uh, well, we've got to speed on because I actually don't even think we're going to get to Simon for a second at this point. Well, excuse me, sir. Quick thing about delivery. Um, think about deliverability. It's a brand new airport in the middle of nowhere, huge construction risks, huge permission, permitting risks. You've got to get all the new businesses there to support the airport and your workforce and the rest of it. And yet you say it's no more risky than expanding Heathrow. What do you need to do to mitigate those risks and who are you looking to help you actually deliver it in a sensible time frame? On the construction side, uh, we've had an extraordinary amount of support from our colleagues be they cost consultants, contractors, um, construction managers, project managers. We've drawn on that wealth of experience that we work with daily. So we have no doubt that building an airport in the middle of nowhere where you've got fantastic access from the sea, you've got a port right next to you, is something you can de-risk as a construction activity. In terms of how do you move the businesses... There are not a lot of businesses clubs in West London, not East London. Yeah, and you've got 15 years. You've got 15 years to alert people that this is going to happen. You've got 15 years to alert them of the opportunity for their businesses to grow. Paul. Uh, embodied carbon. Massive infrastructure, massive initial development, and a swathe of ancillary support, as we've just highlighted there, in terms of businesses and indeed people, obviously, to uh, service the businesses and the airport. How do we square that with our carbon commitment? By doing it as efficiently as we possibly can. Uh, a large part of um, construction carbon emissions is how you transport things to site. Um, if you do it in small pieces, multiple loads, consolidate. Build the big bits around the country and bring them in by ship. That's the best, the lowest carbon way of doing it. Design it from the outset with that thinking, with that imperative in mind. That's what you do. No, time is going to be very, very short oh, because people... Very quick question, actually, on behalf of Dr. Ralph Spett of uh, Jaguar Land Rover. You mentioned just now, Hugh, the middle of nowhere. I would put it to you that if you happen to be in the middle of England, such as uh, Birmingham, um, to say you don't just have to drive down the M40, you then have to go around the M25 and along the M2 to get to the um, uh, UK's hub airport might be a bit of a stretch, if, particularly if um, Dr. Spett, like... Uh, most other people, unfortunately, majority of travellers from Britain's airports do insist still on using their cars. If we believed we can build a true four-runway airport, a hub airport, with the efficiencies that we should have from a new construction, rather than trying to squeeze a, squeeze a bit in here and a bit in there, if we believe we can do that somewhere in the centre 
of one of our major cities, if we think that technology is going to solve all those problems of risk and noise, I'm sure we'll do it. Okay, don't see that. Questions from the floor, because we're really at the Minister of Potatoes is waiting. Thank, thank you. Uh, right, my, my could you identify yourself, tell me where you are? Yes, my name's Jill Moore. I'm one of the Friends of the North Kent Marshes. We were formed in 2004 out of the No Airport at Cliff campaign. Our opposition is firmly focused on all the estuary options, including Sir Howard's. We do not see any of these ideas as realistic economically, environmentally and ecologically. And with over 300,000 overwintering and migratory birds using the estuary, even more live there all year round, these plans are subject to an increased bird strike risk up to 12 times greater than any other major UK airport, which itself would necessitate even more habitat destruction for miles outside of the airport. Thank you, that's a statement. Thank you very much No, indeed. I want to ask him... Well, it has to be very quick. Where, where does Hugh Thomas envisage, envisage these new habitats being created? Thank you. That's the question. Right. I think we've got a number of options. Um, we have to deal with how we replace habitat full stop. So this is an evolving debate. Do we buy farmland that we're going to lose, that we can no longer protect um, and use for arable purposes and re-engineer that so it becomes intertidal habitat, it becomes salt marsh habitat? Is that an opportunity that we've got? Well, the Environment Agency thinks that is the case. Okay. Can we do it on a scale big enough, or do we need to create new land? That's, I completely accept that's something we have to research. Good. Gentleman there. Hi. Uh, Jeff Moore from uh, the Shuttle Front. Um, I've just done some quick uh, mileages and, and worked out with Simon. He must have been think exactly what I was thinking. I'm based in southwest, uh, down in Dorset. And uh, I've just done some mileages, and Plymouth to, uh, let's say, the Isle of Sheppey, Isle of Rain, is, is about a five-hour drive, it's 270 question, miles. Question, question. Can I get, just say that, you know, have you actually looked at the southwest and, and you can imagine Devon, Cornwall, Dorset, Somerset, and those Thank places you. Are, are, you know, are just going to, it's going to be quicker to go to Manchester or Birmingham. Yes, we've looked at the, the rail network, how we can get in, how we can uh, bring services on a half-hourly half basis, um, connecting into Great Western, going round the outside of London. So we believe there is the rail capacity. The other critical thing, though, is, and we heard it earlier on today, how the regional airports connect into uh, the UK hub. We can provide a level of capacity here that will allow the regionals to fly in and get the connections they desperately require to global markets. Last question. Thank you. Andrew Parker, Financial Times. Um, Boris and Daniel Moynihan clearly fear that the way Howard Davis is structuring Phase 2 is work seriously impair the ability of the Isle of Rain proposal to ever get on the short list. Do you share that fear or not? Not at all. Ha, that got us right up from Mr. Patino. <laughs> We're five minutes late, sorry we have to shut it down, but listen, thank you so much indeed to Hugh. Um, our expert panel, our expert panel with three more outings this afternoon as they interrogate each of the shortlisted proposals, but for now, bon appetit, please try and get back sharp. Thank you. Welcome.